good evening and welcome to the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Lecture Series. Uh, we organise, uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, an ongoing lecture series um, once a month, last Tuesday of the month, more or less. And uh, we also get involved in some other uh, activities. Uh, last year we organised <coughs> excuse me, a conference uh, in collaboration with some colleagues at the University of Kent called Breaking Convention. Was anybody here that was there? Yeah. yeah a few of you. I'd just like to throw in then that there's still a few of the posters on sale. Uh, there's an empty edition <laughs> prints left. There's about three posters left, which I forgot to bring with me. They're 25 quid, but if you're interested, do kind of get me afterwards for one. Because um, it'll be next year soon. We'll be doing another conference, hopefully. But yet to confirm a date, I hope to do that soon. But probably July next year at the University of Greenwich with a bit of luck here in London. Um, so we've done a series of talks, various lectures, mostly of a kind of shamanic or kind of ecological theme, archaeology, anthropology, and quite often psychedelics as well. I'd like to give a plug as well, and I've seen some other flyers uh, for a talk. We have uh, one of our speakers from Breaking Convention in town. He's not speaking here, but he is speaking um, on Saturday to Lindy II, uh, giving a very interesting talk about psilocybin and mushrooms. So if you are interested in that, please do go along with some flyers downstairs. Um, just a final announcement, normally there's a lecture uh, all the way up until July, but because the Olympics, I'm not going to have one in July this time, because I, for one, am going to get out of London. Um, <coughs> and we'll start again, excuse me, uh, in September with the lecture series once more. Uh, but tonight, it's with great pleasure, I have to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, he's come all the way from yeah, the next room. Uh, that's me. So, uh, <laughs> I'll be giving a talk about uh, coyote hunters of the Holy Mountain and getting cactus lodged in your revo reducing valve. So this is a talk, um, kind of largely in two parts, uh, but I'm going to have to kind of massively speed it up and I'm going to cut through quite a lot of stuff. Because uh, hopefully, I think, Nina, are you here? Poncho? Oh, well, maybe we might have a special guest in to give us a bit of a talk. So the first talk's about my research into psychedelics and parapsychology, and how that inter interrelates with the second part of the talk, which is about the uh, Quichol, so-called Indians, the indigenous people of Mexico, who uh, have been using peyote in their ceremonies for thousands of years. And hopefully, uh, I'm not sure, somebody, a representative from Mexico and the Quichol tribe is going to come and give a few words. Um, if they turn up, then I'll come and speed up and cut my talk in half and they can have a few words to talk about it. If not, I'll just carry on wanging on until you'll get bored of me. No, before that, hopefully. Um, okay, so the first part of the talk is going to be the uh, getting cactus lodged in your reducing valve. Uh, this takes me to my research. I'm going to lecture it. I'm going to use this, actually. Sorry, yeah. Now, uh, I'll just wire up the speaker for the talk. I feel like that. Thank you, Joe. Can you all hear me? Yes. Did you hear me before? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, there you can. So, I am a psychologist, a senior lecturer at the University of Greenwich, where I conduct research into parapsychology, um, which is uh, the kind of hidden aspects of the mind, um, communicating in, in ways beyond what we understand by what's possible in ordinary science. And one of the things I look at most of all is ESP, what we call extrasensory perception, but not just that particular part of extrasensory perception, which is precognition, which is looking into the future and whether or not that's actually possible. I'll also look at some other stuff, but that's my main area of research. So it's quite convenient in a way that I'm based at the University of Greenwich. You've got the Greenwich Meridian going straight through it. So kind of one of the half of the campus is in the future and the other half is in the past in a way. So <laughs> it's perfect for this kind of research. Um, my other interest is, and I do some work with the Beckley Foundation, is in uh, the research of psychedelics and altered states of consciousness, usually through neuroscience. Um, so I, I tend to combine both of those research interests together, I commit double career Harry Carey by having an interest in two massively taboo areas of, of science, psychedelics and parapsychology. Um, so my interest in this uh, well, people's interest in this goes back a long way, all the way in, in the old world to the temples of Delphi, the ancient oracles there, who had an interest in divining the future. And it's said that they would sit atop a stool 
in an altered state of consciousness and prophesize the future. And people would come from all over ancient Greece to um, visit them, the oracles, and get divine what was going to happen in, in important kind of uh, uh, events, such as uh, this chap here uh, who was uh, planning to invade Persia. And he went to see the Oracle of Delphi and asked, what's going to happen if I invade per Persia? And of course the Oracle went into an altered state of consciousness and said, a great empire will fall. <laughs> and so off he trotted, invaded Persia, and of course a great empire did fall, but it happened to be his own, and had a bit of a bum move. So we didn't quite understand the, the, the insights of the Oracle there. But it said they would get into an altered state of consciousness under the influence of various, like, various psychoactive substances be it psychoactive gases coming up from the rock fissure or various plants of the Solanaceae family such as this one. This is henbane <coughs> which once upon a time used to be called English tobacco that must have been quite an interesting time in our history uh, but before that the ancient Greeks you would call it um, Pythonian named after the, the, the visionary goddess they worshipped at Delphi, the Python uh, we find other etymological links as well with the Solanaceous plants. This plant here, if anyone who can speak German, you can correct me, but in uh, ancient Northern Europe, it used to be called Al Brown. Um, uh, as <coughs> it gets its name from the root divinity uh, letter word, uh, sorry, excuse me, it gets its uh, root name from this divinity letter system, the runes, as does the visionary seeress, the Al Runa. The goddess. So we see the use of both mandrake and henbane used for divinity purposes. Uh, but ev everywhere else as well we find across time and across space, across history and geography, we find the use of psychoactive substances for psychic purposes, uh, primarily by people who we call shamans. And a shaman may loosely be described as somebody gets into an altered state of consciousness um, for psychic purposes, for psychic diagnosis, for healing, uh, for information on, on hunting, for clairvoyance, for precognition, for divining the future, for con communicating with spirits. Uh, they do so in the name of their community, but these are people who can get into an odd state of consciousness at will, and usually, or at least many of them, although not all of them, use psychoactive substances to get into an altered state of consciousness. And we find the use of various psychoactive substances uh, by these different people all the way across the world in every continent of the planet. So we have uh, the Quichol Indians in Mexico who use this uh, psychoactive cactus, peyote. We have uh, also in Mexico the Maztec Indians use uh, psilocybin mushrooms for div divination. In Siberia we have the use of fly agaric mushrooms. Um, this is this red and white spotted mushroom. You can see it's also gone to a fashion sense. Uh, we have the use of things like datura in India, uh, paturi in Australia, uh, what's that one? Oh, that would be iboga in Africa. Uh, also things like pagan and hamala, Syrian root in uh, the Middle East. And also in South America we have a veritable cornucopia of, of psychedelic substances such as ayahuasca uh, here being used by the Shuar Indians. All of those are things are used primarily and specifically for inducing uh, states of consciousness conducive to psychic experiences. Uh, it's only in the West, I mean these practices have been going on for at least several thousand years, we know from the archaeological evidence, and yet um, in the West we've only recently kind of so-called discovered them, but rediscovered these, these substances. And as long as the psychedelic explorers in the West have been uh, experimenting with these substances, we have incidences of uh, kind of parapsychological phenomena, if you like. So this man here, uh, Albert Hoffman, who discovered, stroke invented LSD on his very first LSD experience, which was a complete accident. He had an out-of-body experience, found himself above his body, and thought he'd died. Uh, this man here, uh, who is actually a man, believe it or not, is uh, Humphrey Osmond. Uh, he was the man who coined the, the word psychedelic in conjunction with this other man here, Aldous Huxley, the writer. Um, and Aldous Huxley heard about uh, Humphrey Osmond's use of mescaline back in 1952-53, when Humphrey Osmond had written an article in a journal called the Hibbert Journal, and he said a couple of things, uh, one of which was that Science now has to change its, its parameters and take into account 
uh, extrasensory perception as, as a kind of known phenomena, and also to explore the use of uh, psychedelic <coughs> substances such as mescaline. Um, now, Aldous Huxley uh, hadn't taken psychedelics before meeting this man, uh, Humphrey Osmond, uh, but he had uh, been exploring the philosophy of, of this man here, Henri Bergson, who came up with this concept of mind. Uh, whereby the brain doesn't create consciousness, but the brain is rather a filter of consciousness. That the, the consciousness happens everywhere, all around us, and the brain's job is to uh, reduce that information down, filter it down into a way in which we can function in our ordinary daily life. And he said if, if that didn't happen, if the brain didn't filter, the infinite information of the consciousness would be bombarded with all the entire information of the universe backwards and forwards in time which would open people up to psychic abilities, essentially. And uh, Aldous Huxley rather liked these ideas of Henri Bergson's. Uh, and when he discovered mescaline and tried it, he said that this experience uh, uh, with psychedelics allowed you to bypass the brain's filter, what he called the reducing valve function of the brain, and opens you up to mystical and psychic experiences. Um, I'm only going to touch on this, but I hope there's going to be some heckling later about this. Uh, so quite recently there's been some interesting research. I mean, Huxley's ideas weren't really fully explored um, neuroscientifically until recently, since the kind of prohibition of psychedelic research and psychedelic substances for the last 40 years. It's only now that brain imaging studies have really truly been exploring the, the, uh, the effects of psychedelics on the brain. And one of the stunning things that's occurred recently in this country in the last couple of years has been MRI and MEG research, brain imaging research, with psilocybin uh, mushrooms or psilocybin active principle. And uh, quite surprisingly they found that where we would expect if people are having these extraordinary, uh, overwhelming, massive sensory experiences that we do have on psychedelic substances, you'd expect logically that there'd be more activity in the brain. Although what we actually find is that there's no region of the brain which is more active and there's several regions, several regions of the brain which are less active. And I think, kind of very loosely fitting this, this ties in with this Huxley's idea of the reducing valve function of the brain. I think it's a bit more technical that, than that, but it's at least uh, some kind of vague confirmation of, of Huxley's uh, rather generic ideas. Um, so this is a quote from Robin Carl Hart Harris. It says, Surprise, we see, seeing it decreases was surprising. We thought profound experience equaled more activity, but we find the opposite in fact. So it was about that time as well, 1953, um, when uh, Albert had discovered mescaline, that Gordon Wasser, a banker, went off to Mexico and discovered a mushroom called there, and that's where we find uh, the first kind of uh, records in the literature about the use of psilocybin mushrooms for psychedelic purposes. In fact, um, so that's Gordon Watson and his wife Valentina, and they went off to Mexico in 1953, and they saw this man, Don Arulio, uh, that's the guy with the turban on, I assume, not the young fellow. <laughs> and uh, Don Arulio did, held a mushroom ceremony for them, and during that ceremony he told Watson two things about his son back home in, in the States that neither Watson nor certainly the shaman should have known. Um, Watson then later found out that both of them turned out to be true. And one of them hadn't even occurred at that time, so uh, Don Arulio ostensibly demonstrated some kind of clairvoyance or precognition, or just made a very, very lucky guess. Uh, and that was under the influence of psilocybin. Gordon Watson then took some of these uh, samples of psilocybin, sent them around to various pharmaceutical companies in the States, tried to find out what the active uh, alkaloid was in them. Uh, unfortunately, those big pharmaceutical companies did what they ordinarily did, is they tested them on animals. And of course, it's not very easy for a rat or a dog to communicate when it's tripping. So uh, they were unable to discover what the active principle of psilocybin of mushrooms was. Um, so some ended up in the possession of Albert Hoffman, who years earlier had invented LSD. And uh, he did the sensible thing. Uh, he did a, a, a basic uh, fractionation. He did it on filter paper and uh, he tore the filter paper, which had all the different alkaloids on it, into strips and gave them to his research assistants in the laboratory <laughs> and took them himself. Uh, luckily he managed to pick the one with the, uh, one of the active alkaloids 
and again he had another accidental psychedelic experience. Um, this time, however, he had a doctor with him because it terrified him last time. He thought he was dying. Uh, but when the doctor came over to him with the stethoscope to take his pulse, he, he saw him as an Aztec priest with, a, with a, an obsidian blade coming over to beat out his, his heart. Um, bit of a shocking experience for him. Probably another near-death experience there. Interestingly, uh, Hoffman also observed that when he gave other people as psilocybin or psilocin, um, that they too would have visions of kind of Aztec art, Aztec temples, or Mayan temples, or this kind of thing, very much Mexican, uh, pre-Hispanic uh, visions. And he suggested that perhaps that the, the substance itself, the psilocybin, had some kind of psychometric properties where it takes people back in time to the original users of that substance. And he did have a passing interest in parapsychology. Watson, on the other hand, suggested, well, maybe the artwork that the Aztecs and Mayans produced was merely just inspired by the taking of the mushroom and that's the same thing that other people see when they take it as well. Um, there's no easy solution to that debate. Anyway, the, uh, the chemists in Switzerland synthesized uh, psilocybin and psilocin and they took it back to Mexico and they gave it to this woman, famous Maztec shamaness, uh, Maria Sabina, and she took them and she ingested them and she said, these did the same thing as her little children, the mushrooms, the real organically grown mushrooms. So for her, there wasn't any difference between synthetic psilocybin and that which was kind of obtained through the mushrooms themselves, which opens up a whole other debate about what's natural, what's synthetic. Um, so we find that the first psychedelic explorers all had, all had brushes with parapsychological phenomena and all took an interest in uh, the use of psychedelic substances for accessing psychic abilities, uh, including this man. Uh, psychedelics found their way out of the laboratories and into the, uh, the therapy rooms. This man, for instance, uh, Stanislav Grof, conducted thousands of psychedelic psychotherapy sessions, and uh, during that time, he wrote a book called LSD Psychotherapy, and during that time he discovered that people would have experiences of Past life recall, out of body experiences, ESP, uh, remote viewing, space time travel on a daily basis. It was an occupational hazard being a psychedelic psychotherapist. And in fact, pretty much most of the psychedelic psychotherapists at that time who wrote about their research and their work said the same thing. They all reported people having these kinds of experiences. All right, I'm going to kind of glide through the next few slides because they're quite text heavy. Um, this is more of an undergraduate lecture than the next bit, so I'm just going to gloss over that. Um, ooh. So, uh, so I did some research looking into the literature, I scoured the literature for all of the accounts of this research, and we find lots of accounts in the, the psychotherapeutic settings. Uh, it was corroborated by other research. Uh, <laughs> But we don't just find it in psychotherapy as well. If you look at the survey literature, people have conducted surveys with um, ordinary recreational users who've reported their experiences, and we find a lot of those surveys that people report having kind of parapsychological experiences under the influence of these substances to quite a high degree. So things like telepathy experiences under the influence of cannabis, of up to 83% of people who use it, precognition 32%. Uh, similar surveys found similar things. Uh, psychedelic users under the influence report telepathy 60% of the time. And the more people use these substances, the more they report them. So it's not just a case of sampling people. People who take psychedelics are also more prone to report these experiences. It's that people genuinely feel they have these experiences under the influence of psychedelics. Uh, there's loads of this stuff. I did a research on that, so I did some surveys and found much the same thing. Interestingly, we find that people under the influence of non-psychedelic drugs don't really report these experiences. So people under the influence of alcohol, or prescription psychoactive drugs, very rarely report these kinds of things. Even cocaine and heroin, people don't tend to report these things very much. Um, oh, there's more of this stuff. <laughs> Don't have to take notes. Okay, so that's the survey literature, but just because people report these experiences doesn't mean they're having a genuine psychic experience. We have to look to experimental evidence to that. Interestingly, there was some experiments conducted, about a dozen, throughout the 1950s and 60s, some by um, quite important psychedelic researchers at the time, people 
like uh, Walter Panke, who's probably more famously known for the Good Friday experiments. He conducted some ESP LSD experiments. Uh, so these are just some of the kind of funky high tech technology they had back in those days for conducting this research. There's a lot of card guessing studies. You've all seen the Zeta cards, you've got five symbols, and you have to try and kind of identify which one is, is the actual target. It's pretty obvious here because someone's pointing at it. Um, they did get a bit more technologized. Um, but as you can see, the laboratory standards weren't that stringent, you could smoke in there. Um, you can't imagine that happening these days. Um, so various studies were conducted. Um, I won't go into the details of all those. Oh, you can't see it anyway because it's all in white text. Um, anyway, they conducted loads of experiments during that time using this paradigm of guessing cards, guessing symbols on cards. Often they would last for several hours. Uh, there was using usually a control condition in which to compare it against. Uh, and often the participants were completely naive to psychedelics. They'd never taken a psychedelic substance ever before in their life. And of course they said it was psychedelically immoral afterwards to get them to do that and they said it was extremely boring. Um, <laughs> most of the subjects didn't last the course and just were far more interested in the visions of course than uh, doing the hard guessing tasks for hours on end. So fortunately there were some more kind of methodologically sound studies done where they used a the more what we call free response style where people just say what mental imagery they're getting with the intention of trying to have the same imagery as, as some unknown target and then they'll be shown a series of pictures one of which unbeknown to them would be the target and those studies, a whole bunch of them done, tended to be much better and the ones that used kind of people who had some experience with psychedelics uh, tended to do much better as well so there seemed to be some, some limited evidence for it but again these were kind of quite poorly controlled by today's evidence so it's, it's not really evidential so I figured I'd try and pick up where the baton where I was left off and conduct some experiments myself. I went out to South America, mostly Brazil and Ecuador, and I thought I'd do some research with ayahuasca. Um, one of the reasons, I'll tell you a little bit about ayahuasca, very briefly, I talked about peyote primarily though, but ayahuasca is usually a combination of at least two plants, such as chacruna, which contains uh, dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which you found to be naturally occurring in the body, it's extremely psychoactive, but it's also mixed with other substances such as the ayahuasca vine because the DMT gets broken down in the body, so you need something to stop the enzyme that breaks down the DMT so it can become active in the brain. Um, one of those substances is uh, the harmala alkaloids, um, which we get originally from Pagan and Hamala that was first discovered, so they're called hamala alkaloids, harmaline and harmine. It's like the spot the ball competition if you can see any difference between those. No? Okay, no prizes this week then. Uh, yeah. Top price. <laughs> one extra, one extra. Uh, okay. Sorry? Ah, oh, the extra double bond, yeah, here you go, on the harmine. Interestingly, uh, harmine at one point, when it was first discovered and isolated from ayahuasca, was called telepathy by the chemist who first discovered it, because there were so many reports of people having, well, actually clairvoyant experiences, having visions of people who were dying at the time, or their relatives they found out they were dead in, when they're in the jungle and then they later find out when they get out of the jungle and get to a radio outpost that yes indeed their relative had died whilst they're on the expedition all these kinds of things more like clairvoyance than telepathy but they called it telepathy uh, I won't go into that anyway that's the kind of possible neurochemical model of it so I attempted to do some psychic experiments uh, looking at people under the influence of ayahuasca. So I went into ayahuasca ceremonies and I had this basic setup which I'd used from uh, some earlier research, not with psychedelics, and you're basically shown four images. Uh, this was the original uh, paradigm. You're shown four images and you just pick the image you like the most very quickly and then you move on to the next one. What you don't know is that meanwhile the computer is also selecting an image at random. Okay, you do that ten times and uh, if you manage to get as many more images than chance, you've done well. So there shouldn't be any connection, it's completely abstract, it's completely independent. If you're able to select the same image as a computer, then we say that you've got what we call a hit. Um, but there needs to be a kind of reason why people do that. So I had a kind of 
inbuilt purpose behind it. So if you did better than chance at selecting the same image as the computer, chance, chance effect would be you get 25% of these right over any amount of testing. So if you did better than chance, better than 25%, you were rewarded with something. So a kind of inbuilt incentive. <clears throat> but it's hard to find an incentive which is common to everybody. So I used erotic images because it's a basic human fundamental drive, pornography essentially. And, um, but I an extra twist to it, so the better you did, the more erotic the images got. <laughs> if you did worse than chance, I get to do a, one of these cognitive psychology tasks, which are extremely boring, um, where you have to kind of observe numbers and it's a kind of, uh, kind of vigilance task. And the worse you did, the more boring it got. Uh, and people under those conditions, under repeated experiments, uh, around three experiments with 200 people in total, overall did much better than chance in this task when they didn't know they were taking part in a, in a psychic test. So that was quite interesting. So I tried to adapt this for use with psychedelics. And what I got people to do is, because they're using fractal images, I got people to try and visualize the, the actual target ahead of time. So it was an intentional task. They knew what they were meant to do. So they closed their eyes, they try and visualize, and then they'd open their eyes once they've got something in their mind's eye under the influence of ayahuasca and then they'd try and say which one of those most matched their vision and then the, the computer would randomly select one as the target um, I failed miserably uh, one of the reasons why I think is because this, this task wasn't really set up for that kind of thing it was, it was never meant to be an intentional task uh, part of the problem being that the, the, the fractal images are too similar. In this kind of research, the idea is trying to get pictures that are as different as possible so you can pick out the nuances in, in the mental imagery that you're getting. So after kind of uh, five uh, ceremonies, I went to three trips to South America uh, and kind of about three years of research, I didn't actually come up with anything on that. <laughs> Fortunately though, I also have quite a tough time on ayahuasca, so I figured, well, uh, let's do some research with um, San Pedro cactus, which also grows in South America. It's a bit more direct, uh, it's easier to work with in a way. I mean, it's quite difficult doing this research. People in a kind of extremely old state, they're in the middle of a ceremony, they usually do it just after the ceremony, but people, you know, they're, they're in a completely different state of mind. You present them with a computer and they're, they're not really uh, invested in, in, in doing that. You know, they're more in, engaged in the visions. So I tried to begin this research with San Pedro cactus instead, had a slightly different paradigm. And uh, I went along to the Andes and I went to see a and I, uh, a San Pedro uh, healer there, and I asked him, can I, can I do some experiments, psychic experiments in, in your San Pedro ceremony? And he said, sure. I was like, fantastic. So we all get ready to, to get on with it, and then I pull out my computer, and he's like, no, 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 this is nature, you can't, you can't bring a computer in there. He actually just walked me to the edge of, of the mountain, overlooking this valley, he said, my, my ancestors have been here for hundreds of years. And he just took out like a big con shell and he, he turned me to the four directions and he just blew it on my backside as loud as possible. And that was his way of saying, you're in nature here, you can't bring your computer into my ceremony, that's just not going to work. So, uh, I lost that opportunity. I wasn't just going to go to the beach whilst I was in Ecuador, so I thought I'd still do the research. And the idea was that I'd do it on myself. I'd be, instead of collecting 20 participants, I'd do the experiment on myself 20 times. Now, fortunately, <laughs> I'm a dedicated scientist. Um, fortunately, uh, San Pedro cactus is, is quite long acting, it lasts for 12 hours, so I did it all in one go. Uh, so here's the, the, the sample one person, <laughs> free response, what we call precognition design, just 20 trials. And the idea is you, you do, I, I visualize what I think is going to be the target, uh, with the intention of trying to visualise what the target is. Then I see four video clips, a minute long each, none of which I've ever seen before. I've had a research assistant develop these uh, without me seeing any of them, and put them into pools of four, of four as dissimilar videos as possible. And then I do that 20 times over. And then I, so I, I do the visualisation, I then write that down, make some notes, uh, I, sit, I watch four one minute video clips, and then I try and decide which one is the target based on my, how well it corresponds to my visualisation. And then I do a randomisation procedure on a computer with a random number generator and that selects the actual target. 
um, <clears throat> and I vote in order of kind of how much they, they will like it. So the point of video clips for trial, <clears throat> and there's no way to cheat at this task, I and mean, you should just get a 25% hit rate by chance because my, my kind of rating and, and the actual choice are completely independent. Oh, you can actually see that. So, um, here's one of them. Here's, this is one of the look that I got. So it's 12.32 p.m. Something rotating like copter blades, space, more mechanical stuff, spacecraft, space skeletons. And then it was like water, submarine, a big rig, but underwater. So that was what I kind of came up with my visualisation. I then watched four clips, and uh, well, I'll show you the first clip that came up, which I decided was actually the target. I haven't got the mic, doesn't work on the uh, headphones, so. I think it's considering that they're brother and sister, but I won't go into that, that's a whole different talk, uh, more of a Freudian analysis. Um, but if you go back to what I said there, you'll find that, uh, uh, so it's, it's rotating, like helicopter blades, space, more mechanical stuff, spacecraft, space skeletons. What do you think about the space skeletons? If you look at the stormtroopers, they're like high-tech skeletons in a way, they wear these big white kind of outfits, they've just got black eyes and a little black mouth, so that was kind of... Clearly, I voted this one. This is definitely 100% confidence. This is this is the target. The others were just random stuff: birds flying and hippos dancing in water. So that was clearly the target. And they repeat this process 20 times, and I was managed to get much more hits than you would consider would be possible by chance alone. Another one, for instance, was one of uh, it was kind of sand dunes, the sands of time, and it was a clip of. Uh, a sidewinder snake going across the desert, that was also the target, and there was numerous other ones. So they were more symbolic than actual literal, but I was able to actually get the correct target a number of times. I don't consider myself to be particularly psychic, so I think it must be something to do with the uh, mescaline I was under the influence of, although we can't be exactly sure either because I didn't do a controlled condition, it just needs further research and it also needs somebody to replicate this research, so you know, if some brave scientists are out there willing to do this and all the best. And there's another one, I'm going to show you that. Those of you who are statistics freaks, this was a, a significant bit of research. So that takes me to my interest in peyote, and I'm trying to go to the second part of the talk now, about the peyote hunters of the Holy Mountain. Um, I've been at this poncho here, yeah? Poncho here? Hey, okay, great. So, I'll get Poncho to come up and, and, and give a talk in a minute. Um, I'll give a brief introduction to, to, to what Poncho is going to say. Uh, so, I've also had an interest in other mescaline containing substances, uh, such as the peyote plant. Um, I've been out to Mexico about numerous times over the last 13 years, and uh, on those visits, I've been into the desert in the north. And I've met with the, the, the group of Indians there called the Huichol Indians. Uh, they're better known, actually, but they call themselves the Wiradica. They don't call themselves the Huichols, that's a, what the Spanish name for them. Um, but I never managed to actually kind of make, strike any communication with them because they keep themselves quite separate from, from Westerners, ordinarily. And for good reason, because they were never really infiltrated by the, by the Spanish. They're a pre-Hispanic culture. Uh, they don't really consider themselves to be Mexican as such. Uh, when the Spanish came, <coughs> uh, they managed to resist, they were kind of desert nomads, 
and they lived in the desert of the north and they would leave their pipes to do their ceremonies, go to their holy mountain. Um, eventually they, they moved to the other side of Mexico, one of a mountain in, in the north, uh, in the corner of four different states called the Sierra Huichol. And they stayed there and were never infiltrated by the Spanish in 500 years. They managed to keep their, their culture completely intact, their traditions and their use of peyote, which they've been using for thousands of years. Archaeological evidence suggests they've been using it for at least 5,000 years, possibly longer. Um, so one of the things they did is, but they still wanted to use their peyote, but their peyote didn't grow in the same place where they lived. They moved up to these mountains to get away from the Spanish. And um, so they would go on a pilgrimage every year. So at a certain time of year, you'll see the huichols in the desert of San Luis Potosí, in the town of Real de Catorce, and around the desert in their holy mountain, the Camado. They go up there once a year. Now they used to spend two months or more going there, two months going back. These days, uh, they've done a month-long pilgrimage, they have to get a bus most of the way because you can't actually get there on foot because there's kind of ranches have, have kind of uh, fenced off a lot of the land in between. So they go there, they collect their peyote, they gather everything they can, they worship the, the holy mountain, they go to the hunting, holy mountain, they do their ceremonies. This is where the sun was born according to them. And they have a, an intimate relation with nature and ecology. Um, they take their piety, they go back, and they do a ceremony there, and then they have enough peyote um, to last the people in the community for the rest of the year, which they use for their healing ceremonies, for connecting with nature, for divination, for, for healing, uh, for shamanic practice. They're a shamanic culture, not only a shamanic culture, but they're the only psychedelic shamanic culture which has remained completely intact. They're the only one. We have other cultures, we have other shamanic tribes around the world, which have been using other substances such as ayahuasca, but the, these are the only shamanic psychedelic culture which have never been infiltrated by Westerners. Uh, they've, they've, they've managed to keep their culture as it was, and so their traditions are entirely the same as well. Um, so in the desert, they go and collect their peyote, they make this fantastic artwork of, of the visions they obtain, and they've been doing this for a long time. The majority of uh, the Huichol community make art and they sell it and that's one of the ways in which they, they uh, manage to survive up there at the top of the Sierra Huichol. So there's the images of the peyote uh, with the deer above it and the peyote and the deer are synonymous. Uh, the peyote and the deer are part of the trinity, the holy trinity is the, the maize, the deer and the peyote which is the three things you need to survive, that's all you need. For them, for their culture to remain intact. And so one of the things they do, because the deer and the peyote are synonymous, they actually go out to the desert and they hunt the peyote uh, with bows and arrows. Um, and they'll stalk up on it very delicately and shoot three arrows around the first peyote they see to trap it so it can't get away and they're able then to collect it. So they make this fantastic artwork, they use beads quite often and it represents the kind of visions they have often very geometric uh, in nature. Uh, it's like you're kind of seeing the kind of energy principles of things when you, you experience this. Everything is, is covered in a beautiful, colourful, geometric lattice and, and, and it's pulsing and vibrating. Um, so there's a kind of typical Huichol uh, Peyote Mandala which they make. Uh, so these are some of the Huichols uh, I met. Interesting, I've just come back from Sunrise Festival. Um, I don't know was there, it's really muddy. I went there last year and I had a kind of quite a synchronous event. I met my good friend Carlito. Uh, Carlito Burrito is also known as the, the best. Anyone here from Brighton, he has the best and only authentic Mexican uh, street food restaurant. Them straight! <laughs> Down straight, uh, Carlito Burrito. Anyway, I was uh, fortuitous enough to be given uh, some money for a project that day and I didn't know quite what I was going to do with it and I went up to Carlito and he told me, this was last year, how a Canadian mining company planned to blow up the Holy Mountain. And we've seen some um, licenses from the Mexican government, from the Mexican president who not long before when he got inaugurated dressed up in Huichol costume and gave a speech how he was going to protect indigenous people's rights in Mexico. Um, 
and then um, talking out of both sides of his mouth, gave a load of licenses out to a Canadian mining company called First Majestic Mining, who planned to mine uh, the Camado and about a million acres of prime virgin habitat wilderness, which has endemic flora and fauna, which you don't find anywhere else, lots of peyote, of course, which is you know essential to the Huichol's very fundamental nature of their, their culture, their traditions, which they've been keeping together for thousands of years. Um, now their, their mountain is, is completely sacred to them, they've been going on this pilgrimage for 500 years. Unfortunately, uh, it's also stuffed with about a billion dollars of silver, so you can imagine uh, some people want to get their hands on it and, and exploit that resource. Uh, unfortunately, many bad things, I think, for the people living around there. Um, the, the communities in the area, uh, they only live on uh, tourism to the small town nearby. Uh, the mining process will extract millions of litres of water out of the ground, which is also already very arid. Uh, they, and how they plant to mine it, it's not just like digging mines, they plan to just blow up plants with dynamite and smear it with cyanide and other toxic chemicals to extract the silver. So these are the creatures, these are some of the people I met from the Kumiata clan. Um, they're interesting people. They, so the, the, the Holy Mountain is kind of 500 kilometers across the other side of Mexico. Uh, and the desert sun is put to sea, and they happen to live in this region up in the mountains, very remote area. They only very recently had a road going up there, so they've, they've, they've very much been unconnected with the rest of the world until now, and they are suddenly interested in making friends elsewhere because they need some help with the situation that's going on in that um, they need uh, help and support from other people in trying to stop this mining company from and the Mexican government from just destroying their holy land. Uh, that's some of the reach our kids when I met when we were there. When we first arrived, I won't go into this too much, I'll let you talk in a minute, Poncho. Uh, the the reach our kids there are, I mean, all the people there just totally blew me away. They're, they're, they're the most pure, beautiful, open hearted people I've ever met. Uh, they have zero bullshit. I've met an entire community of people, a whole town of people, not one of them had any bullshit, any pretense, any, anything to kind of hide or big up or anything like that. They're amazing people. Uh, these little kids there, we arrived, we were, we were camping on the edge of this massive barranca, a cliff, a canyon. Uh, it was probably about 1,000 metre, 2,000 metre drop. And there was all these kids there playing anywhere from age from about 2 to 12. There wasn't any adults around and they were all just kind of playing around on the edge of this cliff. And it was like, you know, the Englishman in me was like, health and safety. I'm looking at my clipboard now, what's going on here? Where are the adults? Who's looking after these kids? But they, they live, they're true spirits, you know, they're totally true spirits. They're, 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 they, they really don't have too much to care about, you know, they, they live a very kind of pure existence in many ways. Um, Anyway, so I won't talk too much about the ceremonies and the things they do. I'd like to get Poncho up to, to give a talk about uh, what's happening with, with the mining situation up there. Poncho, do you want to come up? Um, one thing I will say is that they really blew me away, these people. They're by far the coolest people I've ever met. This guy here uh, and many others. We're doing an all-night ceremony with the peyote in the town. At the end of the pilgrimage, everyone comes back from the pilgrimage, and those people who have been on the pilgrimage get their faces painted with sticks they find in the desert and a special dye they only collect along the way from sacred places. And I found myself standing there at this all night vigil, a peyote ceremony. Uh, everyone's praying, everyone's quite somber, although they've got you know, beer and some cigarettes and all the rest of it, and uh, tequino, which is a mainstream. And there's a guy next to me who's got a can of beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. And I look at it and I think, wow, it's really odd this guy. And they ask his friend and he says, oh yeah, he's 97, you know, he's got no hearing aid, no walking stick, no glasses, no, no, no aids in a way. And he's there all night dancing, singing, smoking, drinking, praying, as are many of the other people there. And the whole town is there. It's like one massive ceremony with a couple of thousand people at it all week long. And the energy they create, the, the magical space they create is extraordinary. They live in a permanent magical reality and have an utter connection with nature. And I think it's really important to protect. So, pleasure. Okay, thank you. A good warm up. Pancho's here. He's um, escorting a Marikami, one of the uh, 
retail shamans around who are giving a talk, giving some talks, trying to raise awareness about the mining project. And Poncho is also an apprentice to uh, Dominic Sui. You, you can't make it tonight, unfortunately, he's not feeling so well, but Poncho is here. <laughs> Here now doing things that, and that's probably why he, he he was he didn't make it tonight because he's been a long way in a completely different world and he's having a little bit of health trouble so he said he wanted to say hi to all of you guys and at the same time to uh, disculpa how do you say it? Apologize. apologize with you yeah. for, for not being here well I feel very lucky. I work with them. I play one of the first uh, mestizos that can get into that close to what they do. And I wonder myself, why me? I'm not a, I'm not a sci scientist. I'm not a, I don't do anything even close to, 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 to have that right to be around them. So what I think is that they probably choose the worst Mexican. <laughs> and they say, well, if we can fix this guy, we pretty much can fix everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel very blessed and very lucky to be around them and to, to be going back to the place where everything starts, to the connection with the natural, with the fire, with the wind, with the mother earth. So, uh, for me, this journey with them is being very teachful. And not just uh, from what I learned about the, the peyote, or, but it's not, just, it's, it's not just because what you see on your, on your visions, or, it's the connections they have with the reality. I mean, it's in a very spiritual way, those visions, they come through they come to the reality. So basically, I always try to explain this because most of us never had the, the opportunity to be close to this kind of thinking. It's, we, we, are, we, we think in a completely different level. We act in a different way. So I, like, like your movie, like the Star Wars movie, I always try to, to use examples with TV or with so I'm going to try to explain a little bit what they do in Wirikuta. Uh, I don't know if you, if you, uh, if some of you watch the TV serial called Lost. Mm -hmm. You know them? You know yeah. the, you know the yeah. TV serial? Okay. Well, in that show, they find these nuclear uh, spots, the, those nuclear like caves, okay. and when they open it, and they start exploring in the cave, they find a man in the computer, in a computer. So when, when he sees them, they, are, they just have an accident, an uh, airplane accident, and they crash in an island. So when they, they find this man, he's like very happy, like, are you here to release me of my duty? No, we are just looking for food. And he's like, well, I have plenty of food here. Uh, if you, if you want, you are welcome to stay. The only thing you gotta do is when you hear that alarm sound, that alarm sound ringing, you gotta press this code into the computer. Because if you don't do that, 
the world is going to end. Mm -hmm. and, they, and then after he says that, he starts running away. And they start like, like question themselves if, 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 if that is possible or not. So some of them are like, hey, you don't see all the things, all the coincidences that happen in, in, in this island? It might be possible. And while they are, the alarm starts. And one of them is like, well, I don't want to take any risk. So he went to the computer and he put the numbers in the computer. So uh, after that, they have a schedule to see who was going to be the next one, and they are always taking care of the computer. It's, the, the, the example I'm using is like very far from what is going on over there, but it's basically the same. The first Mexicans, the first human beings in that side of the world, they tell to the little ones, if you don't walk from the south to the north, to the east to the west, if you don't hunt the deer, if you don't uh, siembra the seed of the corn, the seed, if you don't plant the corn, there's not going to be no rain and the sun is not going to rise. Yeah. Hopefully it was just a computer knowledge, but it's sometimes ceremonies that take them four days without sleeping. Walked, walk, they don't do it walking anymore, has been said, but they do it. They, do, they still do it. And, and they were journeys of 18 days walking while they are cleaning themselves, fasting, I mean, doing a lot of hard work to keep this world going. So there is no way, there is a way, but we all have to leave Peyote to find out. Mm -hmm. But there is no way to, to, to really understand it. If that is gonna, if that is really gonna happen, if they stop doing that or not. But for me, the way I see it, every time they go to the place where the rain rain starts and they blaze their candles and they make their praise and they light their candles, the rain starts. So I, I don't want to take the risk. <laughs> Wiliputa is the computer that they use to go and keep the balance of the world, at least in that side of the world, because here it's raining all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this area is now uh, in big danger because all the mining companies, but it's not just about silver, it's also gold and uranium. Mm -hmm. So it's ironic that the gold doesn't really have any uh, industrial or technologic uses. The only use it has is to keep the money machines going on to, to empower the, the, the countries, the rich countries, or, or, the, the, or to keep this economy that we, we don't even know where it came from. But uh, that kind of things are happening in Mexico. It's also, I think I can use another example that is very, very specific, is the Avatar movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the Avatar movie, I don't know if you saw it, you might. It talks about another planet in 20 years, and where they go and they, they, they do this tribe, and they go to the, where they have the connection with the three of the ancients, the, the knowledge. Basically, the, the peyote is, is that tree. It's where they go and have the connections with the, with the ancients, with the elders, with the spirit from all, all the eras and even from the future and the past. They already knew that the Spanish were, were coming. So that's why they make it. So this plant, the, there is not, for me, there is no way that I can think on that, on that plant, even like a plant, it for me is more like a spirit, it's more like a guide, it's the deer himself showing these people, showing me now how to keep walking in this life, how to continue our journey, our life. So basically that, that's why, why I am here now, because the deer, I'm following the deer steps. I think that we all, uh, need to know that this
things have to be stopped. I don't know why here, I don't know what are the possibilities of each of, of you guys having a chance to help, but there is gonna be, you, you will find the answer in, in, in you. There is only a little, that that little part that every, all of us can make to keep this world going in a different way, with different solutions, is what is going to help. It's, it's going to help. So, uh, the connections, the connections they, they have with these plants are magic. They have it on their dreams. I have plenty of examples about that connection. And, and they're just like simple examples, but that really moves you and to be doing something like this. <laughs> For example, I'm going to give you one of those. If, I, I don't know if, how many times we have, or if you want. Or, okay. Well, uh, I have this little, little dog that I didn't know how to, to name it. I didn't, I didn't have a name because I, before that dog I have two another ones and I dream their names. And it was very, when I dream it, my, when I dream the second name, my father came with the, with the newspaper with an article with the name that I chose, so I, I, I knew it was the right name. So with that, with that dog I didn't knew. Anything came, came to me like really feeling. So I asked, I used to have my dog, I, I used to own a bar, a restaurant. So when I, when I was closing the doors, the, door, the dog was walking all over the place. So the people used to call that dog the, the, the bodyguard or the bouncer, the guardian. But I didn't like it. So my niece calls me and she asked me for another dog for her. So I give, I give, I give her another dog, a girl, a female dog. And, and she named it Moon, Luna in Spanish. So she told me, you gotta, you gotta name your dog Son. <coughs> and I was like, no, I don't wanna be screaming Son at the party. <laughs> Not right in Mexico. <laughs> so I didn't name it Son. And when Matsiwa, the, the, the Malacame, the shaman that is here in London now with me, went to my place and I see him, I, I asked him, I need a big favor. I need you to call to name my dog because I can't find the name. So he told me, yeah, let me see what I mean. It's usually what, what he says when I have questions. When I have any, any kind of questions, he's like, let me see what is in my dreams. So next morning, he wake up and he's like, yes, I already have a name. His name is going to be Surawe in, in Guerrarica. So I asked him, what, what does Surawe mean? And he's like, well, it's like the bouncer, like the bodyguard of the sun. So the connection is real. The connection it's is real. With the dreams, with this level of conscience, with a lower, another level of conscience, with the with the elements of life. And for me, we all can reach th those levels. If I'm kind of getting close, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm gonna make it in this li lifetime or in the next one or when, but at least I know that I'm following them. And if, if the only thing that I can do is be here and speak with my, my bad English with you guys, I will do it. Because I want this world to keep do, going and I want them to keep doing if we can do it ourselves at least we have we gotta be happy that we have people like them all over the world doing their job even without saying or asking us for anything they've been doing this for thousands of years but now the balance it's every time it's harder to keep so uh, Basically, I don't know if you want more facts with numbers about what Mikuta is, how big the area is, or, but I mean, for me, it's, it's not even about that. It doesn't really matter what kind of minerals they're going to extract. Uh, it's more about 
what's going to happen if we let them do it. And it's, it, the situation over there is very, very hard, like in another, another place in the world, because the people that live, like, they, they don't live in that area, they just go there to hunt the, the, the medicine, the, the peyote. So the people that live there, there is people with no chances to survive. When you ask, uh, I mean, I, I also understand my, my own, I, live, I, born, I was born very close to that area. So when, when you talk to a mom that already lost her husband, her dad, and one of their little children in the mines, because the mines companies were, were, have been working there a long time, and when they didn't were able to keep doing it with the old techniques, they left, and now they're, they're, they're back. They really wanted to do it, and if you ask them, hey, you don't mind that you already do it. lost your, your father, your husband, your son, and they're, well, i rather lost them working in the mines than losing them going to live in the United States or something like that. So they don't really have that many options. But it, it's not because there, there is no more options. It's because for the government, it's a lot easier to make money for themselves and to keep that people in the pool in the so things like, like that, that like that are happening and uh, we have to keep this going. They opening this now. They are pretty much opening this for people to understand what is this about, what the peyote is, what but it's a still a, it's, it's, it's a still a, a a big fight even there. Some of them are like, I don't know what it is it's gonna be worst. If the mines or if to open this and turn this this sacred, very sacred matter into a folklore, into something that the people is gonna think like people dancing and, and it's a lot deeper than that. So I respect a lot what I'm doing there. I feel very honored and I'm sure that is in your heart that you want to be involved in that. Sooner or later you will find the answer, but it's, it's not easy. <laughs> but it's magic. Should we open up some questions? Can you answer some questions? Probably? Sure. If, well, if, if, if I don't know the right answer, I invite some. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. That's fantastic. We're running a little bit short time, but we'll, we'll keep it going for some questions until people get uncomfortable and, and need to have a uh, right, John. Yeah, I, I just wonder how is there a campaign? Do you have a strategy? Yeah, yeah we, we, we all uh, make the we recruit a front defense. It's like it's like an organization conformed by different different civil associations, common people like me. And uh, when we start this we decide that the the elders council of the Wiraricas and a consejo, a consejo, a consejo, council. Well, like a, they're gonna organize themselves and they're gonna lead this. So it's not being easy because the way they have to feedback, they they have assemblies every month, and the way you have to answer to all the legal procedures, the political procedures, go faster. We have been making sometimes mistakes or so for me especially for me and another group of partners we believe that the spiritual way and the going back a little bit to the elders even we even it looks like we are not given answers so on time is gonna be better they the malacames the shamans have the ability to communicate themselves with the mountains with the song with so I don't even know. I mean, they 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 doing that work now. If the if the mountain might be wanted to be in the storm, I, I I use the example of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to to have this change. He like okay, he give his life to make the change happen. So I don't know if what is being told about. 2012 had to be something with this, and maybe that place had to be destroyed completely to for us to 
make that, I don't know. So uh, we are letting them to keep doing this, their job. But the, the front is conforming in, in different tables, the legal, the political, the envir environmental, the communications, which we have a, a page, internet page, uh, web page, and a Facebook, a couple of Facebook. Uh, I can give it to you if you want. Uh, it's also in English. Uh, we have the, the uh, I don't know how to name it, but basically we organize concerts, uh, talks in Mexico. So uh, two weeks ago we had this big, no, like a month and a half ago before we came, we have this big concert in Mexico with 60,000 people sharing for for Wikuta. It's a lot of a lot of people all over the world, not just because of them, but because they went already to take the peyote or they know Wirikuta or for some reason, or just because they they are conscious about the environment, they're trying to help. So uh, a lot of artists they went to, to, to sing there for free. They just and we are trying to make contacts like those also in, in maybe you do, maybe those kinds of people. I know, I, we know that uh, Brad Pitt, Julia Roberts, uh, they already wa were on, the, on that desert having given the peyote. So those are voices that may, we, it can be used. And, and those are the things that we are... We, the, for us, also one of the main things is to give the people from uh, that, that area a di different way of life. So we are requesting the government, we already went to the government, we made march, we, we did a lot of things, but we have, we have to keep pushing and pushing. And for us, the international pressure is going to be very, very, very important. Uh, one thing I was, that, I was quite lucky enough, I gave a talk about this at the weekend, at the Sunrise Festival, and some of the people suggested, well, Abbas, for instance, got hold of this, and then I was lucky enough to bump into the founder of Abbas, who was giving a talk there. And they're very interested in taking up this project and trying to get some support for it. So that's a nice kind of synchronicity and a positive step forward. See how that one goes. Um, cool question there. Uh, yeah. What is the, the state of the peyote? Is it, is it dangerous as it has been in the past uh, for more people for harvesting? Are they still able to get the peyote they need? They're still able, able. I mean, there are, but it's in Mexico when you talk about legal matters. Uh, it's like they 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 supposed to have the protection of the government for get to them the, to get the peyote and they go back with all problems. But the police is always looking after and then trying to get money for more vida. But it's kind of I mean, uh, but not really. I mean, US, they still can find a lot of peyote in there. Every time they go, it's less and less peyote on the, on the area. But it's not just because them going and hunting the peyote, but, and even the people that is there. But because a, a lot of different things are happening. Uh, there are not just the mines, but the uh, tomato industries. That they, and they go and they, 400 hectares, like, full of peyote, they just, and, and, those belong to the governor and belong to the mafia groups in the area. So it's a, it's a, it's a hard trouble, but we are very uh, faith that we're gonna, we're gonna make it. So we're, they, at least they weren't expecting this fight. They, they weren't expecting, they thought it was gonna be much easier. But these guys, these, these men have been keeping this flame this fire lighted and the people can feel it. So we, are, we, we hope we make it. Uh, I wanted to take uh, your connection with the Native American text, so that's my ignorance. You are connected with the Native American We, we are, yes. Uh, Which is quite a strong power we're talking about. Yeah, and, and sometimes things like, uh, problems like similar scum, they were a, uh, some of the one of the proposals of the 
Latin American church was even, they have a lot of money. In USA, they, they try to keep them away and they open the casinos for them, so, and they have a lot of money. Okay. But uh, they wanted to buy some land over there and then be able to take the peyote. To, so it, it's one problem for another one. Okay. But it's, they, they're, they, they're helping and, and, and it's, it's going to be the union of the Indians from the south, the north, and the conscious people in Europe is, one, is, is what is going to make possible this to happen. That's what basically need, needs to be happening. For me, a mine, the job of the mines is not just uh, mining the earth, but mining the spirit of the people, mining the, the, the communities. They're trying to split the, the communities from San Andres, from the communities of Santa Catarina, San Sebastian, uh, the government now, just now that is they, they, they going back together, it's opening uh, files about uh, their territories and they wanted to go back in, into fighting to each other. To, yeah. What's the spirit of priority saying about the situation? What is the spirit of priority saying about the situation? I can understand. What's, uh, what's the spirit of priority saying? Ah, what the spirit of priority says about this? Yeah. Well, uh, there is one video on YouTube. We had this big ceremony, the February the 7th. Mm -hmm. well, what was some is historical because they all went together for one night and made the ceremony and uh, the, 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 shaman, the shaman is basically speaking to the world, to the, to the people about not to be afraid, about as, start asking for, it's, it's, it's weird because even they didn't read the, the Bible or they, didn't, they, they, they don't even know about the Mayan I mean, they are connected with the fire. They don't read, they don't... They, they're talking about the same things, that we gotta be ready, we have to be prepared, we have to be forgivable, we have to be in love with everybody else, we have to be united. That's basically what the, the spirit of the medicine is, is, is telling. But uh, it's, it's one ceremony and then another one is asked to it will be a, it's a, a path. They are like trying to keep that going, and for that, they're gonna be making more, even more ceremonies. But it's, for example, I, I was there on, on, on that day, and and I've been doing things that I, I wasn't even expecting to do. But for example, some of them they don't want to get. Every time you have, you they make a. a a ceremony every time they, they pray with that medicine they they acquire uh, commitments so if, if, if they go on like the candles and they're gonna sing they're gonna be asked for something so not all of, not all of them they are like okay I mean they are warriors but it's so one of the Maracamas that was the one that sung that day now he's like in with a lot of jobs to do. Now he has gotta go and take candles from one way to another one, uh, make another ceremony. This includes also some things that we don't. It, it's hard for us to understand, but like 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 uh, sacrificing bulls, hunting deers. So blood is included. I don't know. I I don't really understand the the, the motives, but there are things that I. I do even I, even without understanding. It's more about faith than, than, than ask questions. Because you, you when you see the results, sometimes you don't you you, you just go. And and I don't that answer your question. Yes. I had time for a couple of quick questions, I think. If you don't want to yeah, please. Um, I don't mind getting personal. You're committed to this. When you took it the first time. Did you have a connection straight away with Yeah, well, at the beginning, it was very light, very magic. 
but I, I have been, there has been times that I've been punished for that medicine. I mean, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know if I have the connection they have where you can basically hear, but I know somehow because all the things that have been happening to me, that there is a, connect, a direct connection. And, and when I talk about religion, I, I wasn't born with Radica, I wasn't born with Chola and Mamestizo. Mm. My, my, my family is Catholic, basically. So uh, for me, it's not even about religion. It's not even about the Father, Son, the Great Spirit, Christ, Jesus Christ. Buddha, Allah, Mahoma. The name doesn't really matter. It's more about the heart that you put into to find the right path. And for me, more than, more than, that's the way that I find it. More than having it on the people talking to me, I mean the peyote or the medicine talking to me, or, or it's, it's more about the, when, when I pray there, I, I have the answer straight away. And I can give you plenty of examples, uh, simple examples too about, about that. I made this journey, I walked by myself for eight days in the desert because I made that promise and what, one of the days I was like really thirsty and I was like, I, I thought I was not going to make it so I said, please, at least give me one fruit and after five steps I found this orange in the middle of <laughs> so those are the connections I, I, I think the medicine is listening and more, uh, it's also the visions but the, with these plants it's, it's, it's magic if you really trust if you really have the faith and if you really put your heart into it. I also tried ayahuasca once because for me the hikuri the, uh, the hikuri the peyote sent me to the that plant. But it, it, it wasn't the, like the, the peyote telling me, you gotta go to with the ayahuasca. But I just follow the way after one peyote ceremony, a friend told me, ah, I already know, I have the right girl for you. And I went, oh, let's see. She worked with ayahuasca. So she gave, he gave me her phone number and I called her. And after two weeks, I, she was like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't, my boyfriend, I'm busy. And so I said, no, 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 no. But uh, two weeks later, I had this dream. And when I tell a friend what was my dream about, he told me, well, I think you got to work with your female energy. And the ayahuasca is for, it's supposed to be the, the, the grandmother, the yayita. The hikuri is more of a female, a male energy. So I think you gotta work with your female energy. So I went, I called her and I said, please, I need, I really need to make this ceremony with you. And it was a different lesson, but it's also something that is like moves, move, move my, it's, it's that deep connection. With I went with her, and when I was on my on my trip, on my ayahuasca trip, which is very conscious. But it's like a dream. You are awake, but if you are dreaming with your eyes, your eyes closed. I was uh, on, on that bed, and after my dream, when I opened my, my eyes, she, she asked me, did you see the courage? And I was like, oh. I was on my dream, on a courage, in a place probably in London, or like the, wear, the, the things that I, I was wearing was like a wedding in this part of the world in, 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 I don't know, in the royal era or something like that. And when I look at my side, she was sitting right next to me. So, did you see the cars? And I went, yeah. We were together, right? And, and she told me, I think we, we were a couple. We were, so I don't know about other lives. I don't know about if you go to the past or the future, like in those visions. But the connections you get, telepathy, that happened with Machiwa all the time. I want to tell him something and he already knows what I'm going to say. So it's, and for me, synchronicity, things like that happen all the time. When I want to see somebody, I found it in the street. 
it's, it's that kind of connection. So she told me we were a couple, we were a couple, and then she said like, "Did you notice you were an Indian?" And I wanted to be better in Mexican. I said, "Yeah, I was an Aztec." And she said, "No, you were more like an Apache." And I, I was in the mountain like wearing Apache clothes. So these plants, this energy, it's very sacred. If you have, if you got the chance to get close. And if you really feel that you have that call, and if you're really willing to take that risk, because it's like another movie, like the Matrix movie. You have the, the blue pill or the red pill. You wanna, it's up to you. Because it really opens another, another, a completely other dimension. And sometimes you just wanna be like, no. <laughs> But I'm glad I did this way. It's been hard, but at the same time, it's, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm here alive. And well, if you give me one I, that, that I want to share, now that I'm doing this, I know there is a lot of people that want to shoot me or want it to be set up. But at the same time, I have all this protection. A week, a week before we came, I, I was with them at a the big ceremony. I mean, I was part of the group. I was attached to the group, to the pilgrims. So I'm, I'm basically one of them now. My Viralita name is Tutume Yawaume, the one that is looking for the flower. Urra Kukami, Kawaitero Miyakararaume. But, but a, a week a week before we went to make this ceremony on, on an archaeological zone in Mexico City. But it was uh, secret because some we 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 find someone that opened the door, door for us and we went but the government didn't want crazy Indians making ceremonies in the in the middle of Mexico City. So we made this ceremony. And the, day, the, 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 the next day, we went to leave our, our offers to the Basilica de Guadalupe. So, like I was telling, it's not a connection just with this or this. Even they use the, the, the symbols or the image or the spirits of Christ, of the, the San Francisco de Assis, the Virgin of Guadalupe, because they really, they had those connections. So we went to leave the, the, the candles. And when we went there, the, it, it, they, they were having the celebration. <clears throat> so when you see people like that coming into the church, the, 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 the priest was talking about uh, humbles. So wow, he was like, he didn't know where to, where to go with his speech. He was like, uh. so we went all the way to the front and we put in our knees and we keep praying. We were praying for a, for a while. So we were just gonna be there to light a candle. So when we lighted, the, the guys from the security in the church, they came and they tell us to, to turn it off. So it was like a moment of, of the, the people were like, what's going on? So we turn it off. But we wait. So when the priest was gonna give the communion, he he he, he had a speech that it doesn't belong to the to the, the the celebration. I mean, it's it's out of order. Right before the communion, he was like, "And for all of you that are in pecado mortal, how do you say that? Immortal sin. For those of you, it's better not to come close and get the communion." Don't forget about that. I mean, the people already know that. But he was like looking at us and telling us. <laughs> so when we started giving the communion, we were like, hey, let's. So we all went, even the little kids, four years, five years. So he, he, he didn't know what to do. But he gave him the communion anyway. And at the last of the celebration, he was like, well, I want to recognize with these people, 
these, these are the real humbles of this country. These are the real ones that the Virgin Guadalupe appears to them, that came to them. I'm humble, but I'm not that humble. <laughs> and those are the humble. So after the celebration, he invited us to go to the sacristia, to the to his office next to the. So he he tell us, uh, you you mind giving giving me give me your candles? I'm gonna bless it for you to take it back home. So I went like, hey, sorry, can I talk? And I tell him, well, if there is one group of Mexicans that has been very faithful since they were killed, conquered, but they still trusting and believing and praying all the time are them. And they are not here to have your can their candle kind of blessed take it back home, they, they're here to light it because they already make a lot of press in, in those candles and they want to leave it here. And he was like, he didn't want it, he didn't want us to leave it. He was like, okay, but just one. <laughs> At the beginning he said, yeah, light it and put it outside. And then I said, no, we want to leave it here inside with the image of the Virgin. So he said, well, pick one and then put it there. So we picked one and then we went to the altar and put it and light it into the altar. For me, it was very touched. I was crying and was being that close and it was great. So when we, when we went out, when we went out, and I, I don't know if this really had to be with the medicine, but I'm pretty sure it does with, the, with this kind of plants, but it's more about how they respect and how they're connected. And with another connections, so when we, went, we were going to go out, he gave us three roses to each of us that are like miracles from the, from the Virgin. And right before we left, I tell him again, and he, and he took money from his, the money that was collected. And he was like giving them money. And again, I tell him, all the, you don't have to give them money. All the money they have, they come here and they leave it. He went, no, 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 this is different. I want them to have a, a, a Coke, at least. <laughs> I'm just going to leave a little bit for my boss. That's what he said. I bet, I bet you that he never, he never ever was in a boss in his life. He had a Mercedes probably waiting for him. <laughs> but that's different. <laughs> so uh, he gave it to us. And, and, and then I tell him, uh, I tell him, uh, that's why I'm going to say that. Uh, don't you think that it's about time the church recognize that there is no need of more gold mines in the world? Like, mm. right? He didn't know. So I asked him for his blessing. I tell him, well, because all these things that I'm telling, a lot of people want me quiet. And a lot of my friends, we already have, uh, we already have been free. Right. So I, I asked him for his blessing, and, and he was like, "Yeah, yes, my son." And he told me, "Go with God." And he was pushing me. <laughs> <laughs> and they no, I really want you bless. And he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I start stand right in from him and then I put in my knee and I asked him for his blessing and he gave it to me but like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, three days later, I crash. I have a big accident. Big. I, I was going fast, 160 kilometers per hour. And I fell asleep. I mean, it's my fault. And <laughs> I, can, I can blame nobody. But, after the crash, I wasn't wearing my seatbelt, anything. And anything happened to me. And I know that it's because all these things, the, the medicine, the, so it's, it's, it's more than just having a, a, a trip. Or it's, for me, it's a way to connect with the, with the spirits of the heaven.
the God with God. That's basically what it is. But we also can get that connection even without those plants. But it's just to do it in a different level. So that's what they do. And you're welcome to do it if you want to do it. Thank you. Thank you.